Hello, my love. Welcome or welcome back for another video. Today, I'm going to chat about the book Atomic Habits. I want to share like three or four points that just really resonated with me uh, this time around with reading it. I've read it about three times, I believe. Um, and it seems to just keep getting better every time I read it. So I want to share those points with you. So let's dive right in. One of the first points that he makes that really stuck out to me is the idea of the small choices, decisions, habits that we have every single day that they add up. And those habits differentiate who we are right now and who we could be or who we want to become. And to get this point started, I wanna share a story, a short story, but years ago when I first got, was introduced into the field of finance, I was asked a question and it said, or, and it was asked, would I rather receive $1 million or one penny that compounded every day for 30 days. Now, let me ask you, if I today right now was like, hey, hello beautiful, hello love, here's a million dollars, or do you wanna wait 30 days with your one penny while it's compounding? Which one would you choose? Now that you made your decision, I'm going to tell you right now, the majority of people, especially back then, the majority of people would say, I will take the one million dollars. Now I know the actual answer why most people pick it, but I have a theory why people do this to some people is because they're like, well, time value of money, money is worth more right now than it is 30 days from now. But the average person is probably thinking, oh no, not that it's worth more, it's worth more to me in the sense of I can get it right now, it's guaranteed. That's what the majority of people want. They want that guarantee that this money's gonna be here right now, this instant, or in the next couple of days. One penny sounds small and minuscule and ridiculous. Why would I choose that, right? <laughs> Why would I choose that? But what the individual who chose $1 million does not realize is that by the end of 30 days, that million dollars that they got on the day one would actually end up being a $4.3 million loss if they would have just took the penny that compounded every day for 30 days. Because at the end of 30 days, that one penny would end up being $5.3-ish million dollars if it was compounding every day for 30 days. Now, the even more interesting part, the part that I like nerded out about and like when I was like relating this in my head when I was reading was in the beginning, like the first two weeks, you don't think you've won. You're like, oh man, I should have took the million dollars. I should have took the million dollars. I'm not gonna have anywhere near a million dollars. Oh my goodness. But when you hit around day 26, 27, I believe it is, that's when it hits over a million dollars. And then you're like, oh, Compounds again the next day and the next day and the next day. 30 days, you're at 5.3 ish, like I said, million dollars. Alana, why are you sharing this with me? What does this have to do with atomic habits? It made me think about, you know, how we talk about in the self development world. If you're involved in the self development world, we talk about 1% better every single day. 1% better every single day. And so many people think it's so minuscule, like the small habits, they don't matter, they don't count. It doesn't matter if I only study my Spanish for five minutes. It doesn't matter if I only write for five minutes. It doesn't matter if I go and work out and I only have five minutes. And he talks about literally that concept of five minutes <laughs> of developing a habit in the book. But we will take that and say, oh my God, it's not worth it. It's not, it doesn't matter, it doesn't count. But those small habits, the small things that you do every single day, they compound and they matter. I know like, I know it's like so hard because you're just like, dude, if I got my goal today, like if you have a financial goal and you wanted, I don't know, $5 million and they said, I'm going to give you this $5 million today. You're like, great. I want, I got $5 million, which I would be happy if I got $5 million. But I could tell you this, the person who actually, I don't want to say works for it, but yes, works for it. Who the person who puts in the energy and the effort and the all the, the, the work into getting this $5 million, whether it is manifesting, praying, um, writing affirmations, but doing some type of mental work growing towards that, that person, one, will probably know what to do with the money because again, I'm not gonna get sidetracked, but <laughs> like the person, that person will know what to do with the money more, more than likely. They will value that money because they work towards it. And the process of becoming the person they became to attract that money is the reward to me. And I'm not saying we don't want to win money. I, I won money. I've talked about that in my videos. I love winning money. I love having money come to me. But I did work. I have done work to attract that. I really do believe that. I don't just sit around like, oh my God. No, I'm like, money's going to come to me. I'm in my season of overflow. 
Money is always making its way to me. My hands are always open. My fists are never closed. I receive, I give, I love, you know, like I'm saying these things and believing these things and putting mental work into those things and physical work by making videos, writing and doing whatever else. Now we talked about the 1% better, right? On the flip side, what if you're not 1% better? What if you're deciding, you know, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to practice my Spanish for five minutes every day. That's, that's stupid. I'm not going to go walk. You know, matter of fact, I'm not going to eat healthy. I don't care. Now, I was going to go over the concept, the rule of 72 and the inverse rule of 72 and go on a whole financial math tangent. But I know I would lose the majority of people <laughs> when I, if I went on that tangent. But all I want you to understand is that if, the true, if it's true that you're getting 1% better every single day leads to X, Y, Z, that means that if you are getting 1% worse every single day by not doing the thing, then you are getting X, Y, Z. Okay, let's think of it like this. You are 40, 30, 40, 50 years old and you're like, dang, I need to start saving for retirement. I need to start investing for retirement. You will have to invest two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times more than if you would have done that when you first started working or in your 20s or in your early 30s. Not saying that you can't invest and save to get reach retirement at those ages. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that it would have been easier for you to just give the 1% every single day or you could say 10% every single month, whatever, every single month, and you would have reached that goal. And it would have been easier. It wouldn't have been such a burden to you because you did it and you got better every single time. And maybe in that process, because you were doing those things, maybe you would even attract more opportunities, more money to you because you show that you're an excellent money manager, that you're doing the right thing with your money, right? I just want you to get that if you're not getting better, you are getting worse. Stagnation is death. That's one thing I used to always like keep in my head. Stagnation is death. Like if you're not growing, you're not moving, you're not going, you're going backwards, you're, you're not going, you're not staying here. You're, you're going backwards because remember we're aging. Like we're literally going through life. We're not like just sitting here. No, like if you're not doing anything, you're getting older, your bones are decaying. You know, you might be getting shorter, more compact. If you're not like stretching and doing what you need to do, you're getting less healthy. If you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. So it's like, what are we going to do? Like, what are we going to do? How are we going to change this? How are we going to improve upon this? I don't care if you're 40. I don't care if you're 30. I don't care if you're 15, 20. It, what are we going to do every single day, these micro habits to get better? What are we going to do? Your age is not an excuse. Age is nothing but a number. But just realize that there are obviously things that happen as we age. And the longer you take to do the things that you need to do, the harder it is to do it as you get older. Muscle. It's harder to build muscle as you age. <laughs> they, they, like Science tells us that, right? It's harder. Not saying you can't do it. It's just that if you would have did it younger, it would have been easier, quote unquote. I don't know how much easier, but easier to keep it on, right? So my question to you is, do you want to pay the price now or do you want to pay the price later? Because you're going to pay a price regardless. <laughs> you're going to pay a price regardless, good or bad. It doesn't matter. You're going to pay a price. We can go work out today, right? Go walk today. We're sore. We're sore. We're hurting. We're, we're feeling, you know, distressed a little bit, a little stressed out in the body, right? but we did it, right? Or, you know, we could wait until we're older, right? Not working out, not doing those things. We're older, we're not well, we're not sick, we're sore, we have hip pain, we have arthritis, we have all these ailments, right? Which sore do you want? Which pain do you want? Because I know me personally, I prefer the pain of working out, the soreness of working out, the pain of discomfort of having to wake up a little bit earlier or to push myself to do a workout that maybe I don't want to do fully right now, but I know it's going to work out for me and I feel so much better after I do it versus being a 70, 80 year old or even younger than that and having so much pain that I can't function in life. I can't hike. I can't, you know, go on roller coasters. I can't go on cruises. I can't travel because I'm in so much pain. I don't want that. And so I don't want that for you either. So which pain do you want? Two points I want to leave you with with this section here. Einstein says, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it, earns it. He who doesn't, pays it. You're gonna pay the price. <laughs> You're gonna pay the price. I know this is not a money class, I'm sorry, but like I'm equating money and finance to our life, our daily, today life. 
We also get what we repeat. I talked about that in my video last, my last video talking about my year, just like how I got to this point of with YouTube, how I went from being this version of Alana to the version I am right now, Alana on YouTube. Okay. So we get what we repeat. What are you repeating? That is my question for this. You could journal that, think about that, simmer on that. What are you repeating every day? I actually wanted to share one more point on this, on this whole topic of compounding and being 1% better. There's a part in Claire's book and I want to say, let me see if I put it in my notes. I think it's page 33, but he talks about how our, our thoughts are compounding. I lost the note. Okay. He talks about how our thoughts, like things are, our thoughts and our habits are compounding for or against us, right? Knowledge compounds. Each book you read not only teaches you something new, but also opens up different ways of thinking about old ideas. This is also why I recommend rereading books because each time you read a book, I mean, reread books that you like, like and enjoy, obviously, but every time you read a book, you're obviously growing. You're getting 1%, 2%, 3%, maybe 0.2% better every time you read a book or worse, depending on maybe what the book is. But once you're a better version of yourself and you come back and read a book, you see different things than you saw before. You highlight different things than you highlighted before. You are like how I just said, like something just dawned on me reading Atomic Habits the third time. So I definitely recommend rereading books. I have a, a video about that, um, rereading books and basically just saying the books don't change, but we do, we, we do, we do. Another thing that he talks about with that, so knowledge compounds, right? But then also negative thinking compounds. If you're constantly telling yourself, you know, I'm stupid, I'm dumb, I don't have this, I don't have that, I, I'm not worthy. You're speaking that. You're brainwashing yourself to believe that. That is compounding in your life. Pretty soon all you're going to pay attention to is what's going terrible in your world. Practice gratitude, practice love, practice growing acknowledge, I mean, not acknowledge, knowledge, things like that. So I wanted to just mention that point because I, I forgot to mention it earlier um, and read that quote to you. But that was something that just like really struck out to me. Like I have that page like highlighted all over the place. But um, yeah, his quote at the end of that says, bad habits can cut you down just as easily as good habits can build you up. So be aware of those habits, the mental habits, you know. The second point I really like that he talked about is lagging measures or what in the financial world we call lagging indicators. So in finance, we I learned when I was taking my series 65 years ago was that, you know, there's leading indicators, lagging indicators, and there's coincident indicators. Leading indicators, just to give you a real quick economics lesson, I'll put it up on the screen for you. But leading indicators, they kind of predict the future performance or point towards it. These are things to, that are to come. This is foreseeing changes before they come, things like that. Current or coincident indicators, they're actually called coincident indicators. I just remember them as current indicators. They're things that are happening in real time. Lagging indicators, they confirm or point towards behaviors, swings, shifts, things like that, that have already happened. And they also show where the economy is, like where it's been and where it may be headed to. It's looking at the, like, I don't want to say past performance necessarily, but it's looking at where we're going, right? So James Clear talks about, and I'm going to read you a quote from him here. He says, my outcomes are a lagging measure of my habits. My net worth is a lagging measure of my financial habits. My knowledge is a lagging measure of my learning habits. My weight is a lagging measure of my eating habits. So like for me, I could sit here and say, I don't know how I got overweight. I have no idea. I don't know. No, I know exactly how I got overweight. I got overweight because I had bad habits, <laughs> bad, bad habits, stress management habits, eating habits exercise habits, a lot of different things. And they compounded and they created this. They're a lagging measure, a lagging indicator of what I have done in the past. And so what I want you guys to think about is what are the lagging indicators in your life? Like what are the things that you notice, the habits that have compounded so much, they've gone so far that you have whatever the result is, whatever that result is. Could be the weight, it could be underweight, could be loss of muscle, not studying Spanish, <laughs> like not getting your Spanish done. Maybe you're, you're, you're doing bad with your schoolwork. Figure out those things. And then I want you to ask yourself, what habits, what actions should I, what do I want to implement in my life so that I can get out of that, so that I can start to move towards the person I want to be? What habits do I need to release 
to be able to move towards where I want to be. Because in this book, like I said, I'm not going to cover all the topics, but really read it because he does have sections talking about also how we have good habits, right? But then there's also bad habits. And if you, we need to unlearn those bad habits in order to get to the good habits, um, or just in general, you could have good and bad habits, but really check out the book. Like I said, you can get it on audible, you can get it, read it, whatever. How do you, how do you read books? Read that book, this book, because the nuggets, the gems in this book outweigh anything that I didn't like, I didn't agree with. There's like maybe one or two things that I was just like, eh, I'm not going to do that. I don't align with that, but everything else. The third point I want to make is something you probably have seen online because anybody who reads Atomic Habits seems to highlight this, but it's the idea of not focusing on goals, focus on systems instead. So like I shared, I shared a little bit in the beginning, a lot of us, we're so focused on goals, goals, get the goal, get the goal, <laughs> get the goal that we forget if you don't have a system, a plan in place, a blueprint in place, where are you going, right? Where are you going? And so he actually, um, I'm going to read some quotes from him because I don't want to butcher them and I really love this section, but he said, you don't rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. Goals are about the results you want to achieve. Systems are about the processes that lead to those results. He uses, he uses an example about coaches and he basically says the coach's goal is to win championships, right? In most cases. And I would think that would be the ultimate goal, but the system in place would be, okay, how are we going to recruit to these athletes? How am I going to lead and manage these, um, the, the assistant coaches in the team that helps me manage the team and teach the team and coach the team? How, how are we going to practice? What is that schedule? It's the systems in place. What are we going to do on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis to get towards the championship? And after this, he lists a couple reasons why he believes systems are better than goals. It's not saying that you don't need to have goals. It's saying that if you focus on the system, you will reach the goal. And those four problems, I believe it is, I will list them to you now. But the first problem is winners and losers have the same goals. <laughs> and when, he, when I read that, I thought about the quote, um, the quote that says a goal without a plan is just a wish. And then I also thought about the, uh, the other quote that I learned in the finance field is that we don't fail to, I mean, I'm sorry, we don't plan to fail. We just fail to plan, right? <laughs> we don't, we don't go around like, Oh my God, I'm going to fail at this. Right? No, no. It just, we forget to plan so that we can get to that goal. Right. And when I read that, I was just like, it, it made me think of that. But he said, if a successful, if successful and unsuccessful people share the same goal, then the goal cannot be what differentiates the winners from the losers. The goal was always there. It was when they implemented a system of continuous small improvements that they achieved a different outcome. And he uses this as an example when he's talking about the British cyclists who uh, participated in the Tour de France and they won, they won. But uh, that story's in the book, you can check that out. The second problem he says is achieving a goal is only a momentary change. And I really like this. I really like this because I'm like, yes, he's right on this. He uses the example of like a messy room, right? Messy room, you wanna clean it, so you go clean it. Great, that's awesome. But what happens when the room gets messy again? We didn't think about that part, right? No, what you have to do is start saying, okay, okay, my room is messy. What am I going to do to prevent it from being messy? And so this for you might look like your system might be, oh, okay. So like you get a hamper and you're like, before I get in the shower or after, I always put my clothes in the hamper. It's like you make it a ritual. Before I go in the shower, I put my dirty clothes in the hamper. Or when I go in the shower, I come back out, I put them in the hamper. Whatever works for you. I'm not saying to do this. I'm just using an example. And when you put that system in place, now you're less likely to have a messy room. Or maybe it will still be messy, but you'll have less laundry on the ground. The point is he wants you to put a system in place, a plan in place to be able to implement said thing so that you can get to the in game, the goal of not having a messy room. Problem number three. Goals restrict your happiness. So at first I was like, what? And I'm like, what does he mean by that? I kept reading. But what he's talking about is that so many of us, when we make a goal, like a lot of us, we're like, oh, I'll be happy when I reach the goal. Or, oh, I'll go do this thing once I reach the goal. Uh, I'm going to grind it out right now. I'll be happy later. That's what a lot of us do. And this is where this one of the things where I was like, I agree with him and disagree with him. This is one of the concepts, but still 
very powerful concept. He says, goals create an either or conflict. Either you achieve your goal and are successful or you fail and you are a disappointment. And again, this is why I agree. And I agree with him on this point. I was like, oh yeah, you're right. Because sometimes we set goals and we don't, we don't get to that goal. And we're like, oh, I suck. I suck. <laughs> I suck. So this made me think about myself. Like when I was taking tests for my investment licenses, the series six, 63, 26, 6, 63, 26, 65. When I was taking them, I failed once. And when I failed, I was like, dang, I suck. And I remember I made, I set goals like, okay, once I reach this goal, I'm going to go do whatever, whatever. I'm going to be happy, but I failed. And I was like, crap, right? I was like, but then I changed my point of view and I ended up fast forward through time. I ended up passing three of the tests, like boom, 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 in less than like 65, 70 days, like in three months period, uh, three month period. But it's because I changed my viewpoint. I wasn't like going in there like, oh my God, if I win, if I, no, I was like, I'm a person who studies. I actually literally wrote on my, I have a little sticky. Maybe I'll put a picture. It literally says I am the best test taker. I know. Was I the best test taker? I know. I don't know, <laughs> but I believed it. And you know, I got to the test. I, I got to that point and I changed my view. I started to fall in love with the process of studying, even though I don't really like studying, but I fell in love with that process. And you know what that proved to me is that I could do it. That's a side note. I proved to myself that I can take tests, that I am a good test taker, that I can do this. And it was an awesome experience. And honestly, I'm glad I went through that experience because it, it gave me confidence that I didn't have before that. Another quote that James Clear said with this is when you fall in love with the process rather than the product, you don't have to wait to give yourself permission to be happy. The journey is the reward. Like that's what I believe. And that's why this channel is literally called and it's presented the way it is. Fall in love with your journey. I'm encouraging, encouraging you to fall in love with your journey because the process, the, the, the guide, the, the, the part of your life when you're going towards that goal is just so much greater than actually reaching the goal. I mean, I've learned so much in the process more than actually hitting the goal because sometimes I didn't hit the goal, but I went towards it and I learned that I could do it. So I hope that if anything you get from this video is that fall in love with your journey, build the systems because becoming the person you want to be, it's amazing. The journey is amazing. I'm not even where I want to be right now and I'm still falling in love with this journey. Okay. Every single season. Problem number four, he says, Goals are at odds with long-term progress. So goals can create this like yo-yo effect. He says, the purpose of setting goals is to win the game. The purpose of building systems is to continue playing the game. A lot of people, when we go for goals, like once we go for this goal, you know, we finish the race, we win the medal. We have nothing to like look forward to. We're just like, oh, I won. And then you go back to eating bad. You don't run anymore. And this is not every person. I'm just saying this happens to so many people. The average person, this is what happens. This is what happens to me. Yo-yo dieting or yo-yo working out, right? And he explains this and I was just like, that is that is golden. <laughs> it's, it's, it's on point because this is human nature. We go for the goal and then we we settle into that. And that's why it's better to have the system in place to become the person you want to become so that you are becoming that individual and it's shaping who you are. It's like literally your identity. And that's what the fourth point is, is really that our habits shape our identity. That is what he talks about. And I think it is beautiful because it actually aligned with the thought I had uh, for a video. And I believe I made it a couple months ago, but, but that, you know, our identity, who we are becoming is so important and it does cost us something right in the process. Like you're not going to be able to just be like, I'm going to be this person. You will have to create more habits. You will have to go after things. You will have to decline certain things. You will have to set boundaries. It's not going to be easy all the time. The quote that I really liked that he said was outcomes are what you get. Processes are about what you do. Identity is about what you believe. A lot of us were asking the wrong questions. We're, we're not asking who do I want to be? Who do I want to become? Who do I say I am? We're, we're focused on just the, the goal, not the, the person we have to become to get to that goal. And I believe that's like the journey. That's the self-development. That's the biggest part of it is who am I? Who do I want to be? And do these two people align? Do these two identities align? And so this is like, my one, like one of the most powerful things that I read in his book um, to me. 
it's just because it aligns so much with this channel and what I believe and what I try to teach to anybody who wants to talk to me about this. Let's use an example that Claire uses in the book. He basically is referring to a smoker and say the smoker comes, somebody comes up to the smoker and they're like, hey, you want to smoke? And the person who hasn't changed their identity will say, no thanks, I'm trying to quit. So that's what they're trying to do, right? Versus the person who has switched their identity, they say, no thank you, I'm not a smoker. <laughs> because they're not a smoker anymore, right? It's the same thing with drinkers, same, same mentality. And when he used that example, I was laughing because like, I remember like me, I would say that sometimes like with drinking, I'm trying to drink, I'm trying to quit drinking. Now I don't even say that. I just go, oh, I don't drink anymore. Maybe I will drink in the future, but I, I don't drink anymore. I'm not a drinker and I'm really not. Like I don't have any desire to drink anymore. I literally became this identity. I chose that this is who I want to be. I don't want to be that person anymore. And this is who I am. Just that small shift in words of I'm not a drinker. I'm not a smoker. It's powerful. So notice that simple shift because it's really, really, it's a huge shift. It's a huge shift in beliefs and words and how you're speaking, how you're declaring, how you're affirming who you are. There's a quote I do want to read from um, Clear that he says on page 33, I actually wrote what page it was this time. He said, behavior that is incongruent with the self will not last. You may want more money, but if your identity is someone who consumes rather than creates, then you'll continue to be pulled towards spending rather than earning. You may want better health, but if you continue to prioritize comfort over accomplishment, you'll be drawn to relaxing rather than training. It's hard to change your habits if you never change the underlying beliefs that led to your past behavior. You have a good, you have a new goal and a new plan, but you haven't changed who you are. He talks about how the goal isn't to run a marathon. It's to become a runner. The goal is not to read books. The book, the, the goal is not to read books. It is to become a reader. You have to become that person you want to be. My goal is not to learn Spanish. My goal is to become a Spanish speaker. <laughs> I want to speak Spanish. I want to be a person who speaks Spanish in multiple languages. That is who I become. I do believe that we decide who we want to be and our actions, behaviors, what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, how we're thinking, how we're reacting or not reacting determines if we become that person. And that's kind of taking it full circle back to the beginning of this video that we are what we repeatedly do. <laughs> like, what are you doing every single day? And that's really my question. I'm gonna say it again. Think about what are you doing on a day-to-day -day basis? And does that align with who you say you want to be? You want to run the marathon, you want to run the 5K. Are you a runner? Do you believe you're a runner? What does a runner do? What does a reader do? What does an entrepreneur who has, you know, is a Fortune 500 company or what does a self-employed person who has a coaching business, how does she interact and react to the world? How does she do things? Does she spend time scrolling on social media? Probably not. Does she spend her time creating? Probably. Does she let people walk all over her or cross her boundaries? Does she let people disrespect her? Probably not. Think about this person who you want to be and put that action plan, that system in place to become her. And again, it doesn't have to be dramatic. It could be 1% every day. It could be five minutes of Spanish, five minutes of reading, reading one page. It's doing the work to become that person, putting effort towards it. And that effort will compound you. I promise you. I promise you it will compound if you stay consistent. Remember, like I said in the beginning, that penny did not, <laughs> did not, it looked, it looked like it wasn't doing anything. But as soon as you got to around the 26th day, 27th, it was making magic happen. You got to keep putting, putting the effort towards it. You're not going to see your, your waistline get smaller in a few days, maybe in a month, maybe, maybe two months. You'll see it really a real big difference. Maybe in three months, your health might be out of place. You won't see a change in your energy and all those things right away, immediately. I was going to try to snap. But you will see it if you're consistent. So journal about that, write about it, think about it. Uh, let me know in the comments, you know, if you have any books, recommendations on habits, or if you had like a nugget you wanted to share from this book. Because again, I didn't share all the nuggets. I This video would be way too long if I shared every single nugget from Atomic Habits. Read the book, read books on habits. Just get exposed to people and places and things that are in alignment with who you want to become. That is it for the video. So thank you so much for watching. I hope this video was helpful for you. If it was, stick around for the next one. I will see you there. 
with all my love, Lana. <laughs>